Hey, welcome back, everybody. It's time once again for Closing the Wealth Gap. The one show, maybe the only show that shows you how to close the wealth gap in your own life with the man who's done it for many, our wealth coach himself, Tyrone French. Hey, Tyrone. Hey, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Closing the Wealth Gap. I'm your host, Tyrone French. What I would like for you to do, I want you to keep in touch with me. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, I have this mobile app. It's app. Absolutely free. All you have to do, download it on your phone. Go to tyronefrench.coach. If you don't want to type that in on your device, just just text it in to uh, text Tyrone French at 36260. You're going to have access to my calculators, to my articles, to all my information. And if you got any questions, just give me a call. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I want you to call 866 866- 296 or 877 296 5192. That's 877 296 5192. Now that we got the business stuff out of the way, we're going to get started. So, without further ado, I have a very special guest in the studio today. Uh, I've known this man since I was 19 years old. He was my mentor. Uh, we served together in the U.S. Navy on Guam. I want you to put just sit back and relax and listen to this conversation. This is my good friend, Mr. Anthony Dunn, U.S. Navy, retired. How you doing, sir? I am doing fine. <laughs> Man, thank you for taking the time to come in here and, and, and just to visit our studio today. What do you think? Hey, I'm impressed. It, re- it really is nice. I enjoy looking at all the decor in here. It's just nice. How was the ride down here? Excellent. Okay. No very traffic. Little, very little traffic at all. Okay. Well, I tell you what. The reason we're bringing you in today is because I want our I want my audience to hear uh, just some of the stories about you know right now the United States Navy or even all the the services are having a hard time recruiting, and they never talk about veteran issues when they talk about the military and bringing people in. They talk about housing. They talk about you know the pay and the stuff like that, but they never talk about after the fact and so i want to have a conversation we're going to get to the point where you know where we actually became veterans but first and foremost i want to talk about how we first met and i was a young pup again 19 years old <laughs> got stationed on an island called guam um in the the west in the northern pacific didn't know where it was i touched down and my first day on guam um it, it was it, it was a trip, and we I ended up meeting a, another friend of ours, mutual friend named David Bibbs. I was in the chow hall, which is for if you don't know what a chow hall, it's a cafeteria, and I was in there and I was sitting down by myself, and um, he came over and we started having a conversation. Come to find out, he was from California, um, Harbor City, and man, uh, he went to Norbine High School, and we just kicked it off right at the bat and i was when i first got there i was having problems with uh with my roommate first day and uh make a long story short he said man i got a i got space in my in my room you know i got an extra rack you can you know just move into my room and man i tell you it was it, it was he was uh, his rate was he was an at avionics technician and I went into the, the the Navy non-designated, not knowing what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to work on aircraft, but I didn't know exactly uh, what type, what field I was going to go into. And come to find out, he was an avionics technician, and the rest is history. So, when did you join the Navy? I joined the Navy December 7th, 1979. December 7th. 1979. Correct. Correct. And did you know exactly what you were going to do when you joined the Navy? I knew I was going to go into aviation. Okay. Yes. So when did you get to Guam? Got to Guam in March of 1980. March of 1980. Yes. Okay. I got over there in 81, 1980. No, I got to Guam in 1982. 82. That's 1982. Right. That's right. I okay. remember. Okay. Now, when you first found out you were going to Guam, what was your reaction? Uh, I was disappointed because I had orders earlier in the morning to go to an attack squadron off the USS Midway. Okay. That was in the morning. And, you know, things change in the military just like right. that. So I come back from lunch, and uh, my orders are changed. I said, you're still going to the Pacific. 
but you're not going to attack Squadron 56 off the midway. You're going okay. to VQ-1. So VQ-1? Said, yeah, and I said, VQ-1? <laughs> uh, what's VQ-1? Uh, it's a special squadron. Well, where are they located? In Guam. You are going to the Pacific. And, <laughs> and I had some uh, idea about where Guam was. I said, okay. that rock? <laughs> okay. <laughs> and they just start laughing at me and, uh, after 16 days leave, uh, I was on my way to uh, Guam. Okay. So I know I got there. You got there in 1980. I got there in 1982. And here's the thing. Uh, a lot of people don't know this about Tony Dunn, but Tony Dunn played football in the Navy. Matter of fact, he was a linebacker. And uh, this, uh, let me tell you, uh, uh, Defensive end. Okay, defensive end. <laughs> defensive end. But you rotated, though, man. I did. You rotated. Yes. Now, here's the thing. This is one of the nicest guys that you're going to ever meet in your life. He has a smile, that constantly, constantly smile on his face. But he was the most fiercest defensive end on that rock. Now, how, how did that happen? How did you end up playing football on Guam? Well, to be honest with you, uh, three or four months after I arrived on Guam, uh, one of the guys approached me and said, well, you know, we have a semi-professional football league on this island, and uh, we have a base team. You might want to come out. Okay. So I decided, yeah, why not, you know. So I come out and and make a long story short, uh won my starting position as a defensive end. Okay. For the District Two Cardinals. That was the name of the team that we happened to play for right. at that particular base. And we played five other military teams and one civilian team, the University of Guam. Okay. And the thing about it with us even though we played football, we still had a job to do in the Navy. Right. So we have like ten games, and I could, and I played two seasons there, and I uh, could never finish the season because couldn't play no more than seven games. Right. Because I would have to go on debt, right. detachment. Right. And. Uh, but you still you still gained a quite a bit of a reputation for yourself though, uh, as a hard hitter. Oh, I did. I did. I sacked quite a few quarterbacks. <laughs> <laughs> and the thing is, the reputation that this guy had, he would hit you so hard, would knock you silly, and he's still smiling at you. <laughs> as a matter of fact, I remember one time we were playing the game. I was playing uh, corner. Right. Left corner. Right. And uh, this huge fullback. Remember that play? Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> Huge fullbacks came charging at me like he was a bull. And I'm running towards him, and he's running towards me, and we just had this collision. And all I heard was, ooh. And I hit the, I hit him, he hit the ground, and I assumed that we were going to both get up at the same time, and he just laid there. And all of a sudden, I heard this reassuring voice in my head. What'd you say? I said, "Good hit, killer." <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I help you up. Help me up. I will pat you on the butt, and, and let's go. <laughs> let's go. And then that's when I realized that I had I got the wind knocked out of me. I wasn't breathing. I was standing on both two feet, but I was not breathing. I couldn't catch my breath. I ended up running to the sideline, hoping that the coach saw me. So that he could replace me. Oh, no. And he never replaced me. And guess what? They <laughs> ran a play on my side and scored. <laughs> never forget that. But, yeah, we, uh, we played football. That was uh, some of the entertainment that we had on Guam. Of course, we had other sports that we indulged in and such. Yeah. Because Guam, you could actually go around that island in, in an hour's time. Yes. And just about everybody knew everybody on Guam, so you couldn't right. get away with anything. Right. When you think you, when you think you were getting away with some somebody somewhere would see you. Yeah. Well, some of the stories we're not going to get into because oh, you know, yeah. this is a uh, this, yes. this this show is PG. Yes. Yes, it is. But I, but I can say this: uh, a lot of times when people think about the military, they're not thinking about. Uh, the recreation aspect of it, as far as the facilities and the the, the things that the military provide, just for uh, morale boosters. Correct. And so, a lot of some guys play football, some guys play basketball. Um, it was just a lot of things on that on that island to do. I mean, you and I have a mutual friend who was actually a boxer. Right. Um, so they would have boxing events, and uh, to this day, we're still good friends. Right. Real good friends. Right. So I'm going to talk about how the the first time I met you, 
because David Bibbs brought me over to you. And tell me about that. Day. He sure did. I was sitting in my room and I got someone knocked on the door. I said, come on in. And again, all three of us are from L.A. So that's right. OK. So Bibbs comes in. Rest in peace. Yes. Love that guy. Uh, he came in and he said, Tony D, because that's what they called me. Tony D, I have somebody I want you to meet. He's from L.A. <laughs> His name is Tyrone French. So I see this young man. He's wearing this uh, golf cap. He had white <laughs> shoes on, blue pants, white shirt. He was a, he was dap- a dapper, I would say. And he shook it, shook my hand. I shook his hand, and I said, "Well, welcome to Guam, and feel free to come back." You know. And then they left. So let's say like three, four days later, <laughs> I get a knock on the door. I say, "Who is it?" It's French. I said, "Come on in." So French came, comes in and sit down. I said, hey, sit down. I offered him a soda, and he got to talking. And he said, the first thing he asked me, he said, Dunn, what's wrong with these guys, man? And I said, what, what's the problem? Well, man, they're messing with me, and they're doing things that I don't like. And I, said, and I listened to him. I didn't say it exactly to, like that. Yeah, well, we're, it we're was keep, colorful. We're keeping it PG right now. <laughs> but anyway, so to make a long story short, I let him talk, and he finished. And I said, French, I'm going to ask you something. Did they put your hands on you? Their hands on you? And said, no. uh, he said, no. I said, did they talk about your mother? And I said, <laughs> no. I said, French... I had to go through the same thing when I came through Guam. It's because you're from California, specifically from L.A., they want to try you. Yeah. So don't worry about it. Just brush it aside. Yeah. Okay? And I, and I, I actually, I patted him on his shoulder. <laughs> and, and, he, and he shook his head. And he said, okay, Doug, all right. And, and he left. Sent me on my way. <laughs> but again, I needed that pep talk. I mean, I'm a 19-year-old kid just out of L.A. And, um, you know, I was really focused on making the making a career out of the navy yes, and i wanted were. to be the best um you know the best sailor that i could be yes you were and um again david bibbs god 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 rest his soul um he matter of fact david bibbs was enlisted when we first met but ultimately by the time he retired he was a uh, commander a commander a commander in the united right. states navy he went uh the program was what ldo yes he did yes so this guy, I mean, it was just what are the what are the odds that I get to get to Guam and I'm around people that were just so driven, so disciplined and organized that to this day, you know, we're still good friends. I can count the good friends that I have on one hand and I could absolutely positively say you're one of those guys. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. So Again, looking at Guam and looking at the military, and I know that you ended up uh, reluctantly getting out of the Navy. Yeah, it was a sad story. I don't want to go into too much detail, but I could not re-enlist due to a medical uh, situation that I had. Mm-hmm. I really loved the Navy, but it was time for me to go, and that was back in 84. Okay, but again, that's not the end of the story, though. No, it is not. So let's let's fast forward to actually where you became a reservist. Okay, fast forward. It was four months before 9-11. Okay. I was allowed to enlist in the U.S. Navy Reserve. Okay. And uh, I went on to do 16 more years. I retired in 2018 with a total of 21 years as active in reserve. Wow. And I retired in good standings. And uh, the thing about it, when you retire as a reservist, they do not pay you right away. You mm-hmm. have to wait until you turn 60 okay. before you can get a retirement check. Okay. But fortunately for me, when I retired, I was 57, so I only had to wait three years. Right, right. <laughs> but again, that wasn't really a major thing for you because you know, I mean, you pretty you had a, a pretty good career at, at FedEx, right? Uh, yes, I actually did. Just under 10 years at FedEx. Oh, now, again, let's, let's talk about your qualifications to get that job because you had to be licensed to get that job. Correct. So what, was, 
Correct. Uh, my uh, background is aviation maintenance. Yes. Well, that's my life. That's what I've done since uh, joining the Navy. And go, well, let's go back to Guam because on Guam, you were actually, what was your rate? I was an AD3. Which was? Aviation machinist mate, i.e. I was a jet engine and power plant systems mechanic. There you go. So I maintain our two types of aircraft that we worked on, uh, EA-3 Sky Warriors, a jet-powered aircraft, and EP-3 Orions. Actually, uh, they, were, they, were, they were Ares aircraft, electronic surveillance aircraft, turboprop. Okay. So let's do this. Then fast forward back to as far as, because you got qualified, you became uh, your license as far as your okay. for, now, for FedEx. Now, uh, years later... After working through the industry in aircraft manufacturing, maintenance, upkeep, I found that I needed an A&P license. Right. Because you cannot perform work, maintenance work, and sign it off without having that certificate. Right. It's FA certified. So I went to school at this institution called uh, Northrop Rice Aviation it was located in Inglewood, California. Okay. But now it's under a different name. It's, okay. I believe it's Spartan Aviation. Okay. Well, anyway, it took me 14 months. I got my A&P, and then I was able to move on to bigger and better things. I left Boeing and okay. went to work for Raytheon Flight okay. Test Center in, located in Van Nuys. Okay. And I worked on this one of the two types of aircraft that we had in our squadron, the A3. Yes. And I did that for about six, almost seven months. And unfortunately, I was a low man on the totem pole, so I got laid off. But you actually did a stint at McDonnell Douglas. Oh, yeah. That's what prior to that. Okay. I worked 10 years for McDonnell Douglas slash Boeing because I yes. was there during the time that Boeing took us over. Now, I was uh, my job title there was K2J, meaning I was a structures mechanic. Okay. I built the airplane. Yeah. The MD-80s and the C-17s. Now, the reason I bring that up is because just serendipity, we yes. hadn't seen each other in I don't know how many years. And I want you to tell that story about how we ran into each other again. Okay. It was uh, one night I was uh, doing a part of a tour at the Long Beach plant because at the time I was at the uh, Torrance plant. Okay. So they wanted us to come down to the uh, magnets, uh, excuse me, uh, the Long Beach plant just to see where all those parts that we make fit and how they go. Right. Okay, and all of a sudden, I see this gentleman in a tie talking to a group of uh, mechanics. And it was French. And I said, I looked. <laughs> and I said, French. And he stopped talking and looked at me. Done. <laughs> and, like, we hugged and we shook hands and... Everybody, both groups were like, Who "Yeah, what, what's going on?" Yeah. Not knowing we hadn't seen each other in years, based on our Navy days. That was, uh, I want to say, at least fifteen years. Yes, yes. At and the reason least. I'm bringing this up is because when I left the Navy, uh, I I got out in 1988, and I ended up there was a job fair right. at McDonnell Douglas. Right. And I was when I was a Navy, uh, I was an avionic technician. I worked with uh, the tech reps from IBM. Right. And I worked in quality assurance. So when I got to McDonnell Douglas, I was prepped. I knew exactly what I wanted to do, had my resume polished. And I was standing in this long line. And somebody from QA was walking down the line, and he spotted me. And he was like, why are you here? So I told him my background. I gave him my resume. He pulled me out of the line and walked me right into the building. And he started talking to the union stewards. And they were going back and forth, and the, the, the language was, was pretty colorful. But they, they resolved the situation and came back to me and said, hey, look, we, we can't bring you in as a grade one based on your experience level. That's where you should be. But this is what we're going to do. We're going to bring you in at grade three. We want to keep you on the floor for about 90 days, and then we want to transition you into a quality assurance administrator. So you didn't see me when I first started working there as far as electrician. You saw me when I had transitioned into a quality assurance administrator. Right. Yeah. So just wanted to tell that story as far as the background because, again, when you put yourself in a position in the military and you have the technical expertise, um, companies will line up to hire you. 
if you if you have your ducks in a row if you've done your due diligence and you position yourself to where you can take advantage of, of those opportunities uh the military is for me was one of the best place uh to get that foundation under me and so then it became up to me based on what do i want to do well you know you had that in you in the first place because you made history in bq1 when you got there you were non-rate yes non-designated non-designated and after you did your smd special military duty on the uss ranger that's right you did not go to the line division. No, I didn't. You went straight to avionics. Went straight to the shop. And that was a first. <laughs> that was a first. And on top of that. But I got a lot of crap for that, too, man. <laughs> <laughs> hey, they saw something in you. You were one of the few African-Americans that we had that were non-rated that went straight. In fact, you were the only one that went to that shop. Just like that, because the people above you saw something in you. Yeah, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. But again, I had good mentors. I had good coaches. And and again, rest in peace, David Bibbs. Um, uh, uh, we got another good friend, Ronnie Madden. Right. Uh, who would literally just take me out to the plane and show me. I mean, to be an avionic technician, um, I would have never aspired to do that. But Ronnie took me out to the plane. He said, "Come on, let's go out to the plane." Uh, he said, "Here, take this, take this, take this uh, straight slot screwdriver. Take this panel off. Uh, take these safety wires and cut cut the wires off the box and pull that box out and pull this put this box in there." He said, "Now come up to the cockpit." He said, "I want you to dial, go to that box, dial this frequency in, and this is what I want you to say." And so I did a radio check with the tower. And so the tire came back that, you know, the radio check was confirmed that he looked at me. He said, how does it feel to be an avionic technician? <laughs> and the rest was history. Wow. The rest yeah. was history. Now that I did not know. Yes. <laughs> yeah, we, we actually, we uh, debt QB in, in the Philippines oh, okay. at the time. Okay. And okay. man, you know, we worked hard, but we played hard too. Oh, yes, we did. <laughs> yes, we did. Because the alternative was this. If you didn't make it back to work on time, you'd get your uh, Liberty Card pulled. Yes. And you did not want your Liberty Card to be pulled. So let's do this because we're going to wrap this up in a few minutes. Yes. But let's talk about, because I know you, you're, for, to me, you're, you're, you're Tony Dunn. The United States Navy retired. And I remember prior to you retiring, we used to have conversations. And I used to tell you, Tony Dunn, you're going to be fine. You're going to be fine. Don't worry about it. Just keep going through your progressions. Um, because I could look at your data. I could look at your financials. You know, we would have a conversation, but I knew what your financials were. I knew even by just based on your income. Like a lot of people only have one income stream. And you, uh, uh, as far as, I mean, you have what? How many income streams? Uh, four. About four income streams. Yes. So when we talk about this show and even closing the wealth gap, we're talking, we're telling people about multiple streams of income and passive income. And so we're so programmed to trade time for money, meaning that we're going to, we're going to trade our labor because when you're working on the job, they're paying you so much doubt, so much money per hour, but that's per hour of labor. They're not paying you for your time. They'll say so much money, you're going to make so much money per hour, but they're not paying you for your time. They're paying you for your labor. And we're conditioned to trade our labor for income. But then there comes a time when we we put ourselves in a position where we have multiple streams of passive income, which I call wealth. And those 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 income streams, the sources of those income streams are now assets. And so I call those income producing assets and a lot of people aspire to be rich and i say no 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 what you want to be is wealthy and my definition of wealth is you're wealthy when the income from your assets exceeds the outgo from your liabilities and expenses and in the united states there are two things there are two sources of just financial literacy or financial intelligence that you have to have and one is wealth and the other is credit and when you get your wealth and your credit together in the United States, there's really nothing that you can't do. And the, the bottom line is lifestyle. So you've, you've acquired, you put yourself in a position to where you can have a comfortable retirement. 
And because of that, you end up doing something that a lot of people at our age really don't do. You end up going back to school. That's correct. So tell us about that. Well, based on what you told me as far as what benefits that were allotted by the VA, I should look into the VRNE program, which is what I did. And after uh, filling out the paperwork and waiting the prescribed time, I was accepted. So now I'm in my first semester at Los Angeles Southwest City College. Outstanding. Yes. Outstanding. Now, who's paying for that? Is that you or the military is paying for well, it? That is the VA. The VA is the paying for Veterans it. The Veterans Administration. Outstanding. And, I, and they also help you with a computer? Uh, yes. Uh, they give you up to $2,500 to buy your computer, printer, all the associated hardware that you need, books, textbooks, papers, and what's up whatsoever so again and the thing is there was a time when i didn't know about the vr vrne program which is veterans readiness and employment uh, program right and so if you're entitled see and one of the reasons why i knew that you were entitled is because you you're a disabled veteran yes i am so based on you having a disability from the military and looking at that program you were automatically qualified for it you just didn't apply. You just didn't know about it. And so one of the things that we want to do is shed light on so there's so many veterans out there that are either lowballed based on their disability ratings or their, their programs out there they just don't know about. And so you capitalize on the VRE program, whereas, again, and I know you're just starting, you, you just started the program, um, but I'm well into the program. And I can tell you this, not only do they pay for, uh, the, you know, as far as the courses, but you also receive a monthly stipend just based on whether you're single, a single veteran or whether you're a veteran with, with dependents uh, and whether you have a portion of your GI bill that you still uh, your post 9-11 GI bill. They'll pay you up to thirty five hundred dollars per month uh, just as a monthly stipend to be a part of that program so that you can go to school, which, again, a lot of veterans are not aware of. So just based on that experience, and again, it's not a perfect uh, uh, system because you got a lot of bureaucracy. But Tell me about it. But based on where you are right now, they, they position you to where is you're going to get this degree. Yes. And not only are you going to get the degree, but they're actually they're paying you to get this degree. So, what are your what are your future goals? What are your future plans? Now that you're retired, well, I want to continue my schooling. Eventually, I want to get a degree in computers. Okay, I would like to go into computer graphics. You know, I used to draw when I was a child. Well, you no longer can draw with your hands anymore. You use the computer. Right. So that's what I'm going to do. And I, and in a in a sense. I need to improve my computer skills anyway. Right. So that's why I'm in school now. But, of course, I have to take my prerequisites as right. such. Right. You know, English 101 and so forth and so forth. Right. And I find that uh, a lot of the youngsters, they they want to help me out. Help the old guy out. <laughs> that's and, all right. But uh, there's another thing. I wear this hat. This hat that I have on is U.S. Navy retired, proudly served. Yes. It's my uniform. Yes. I was looking forward to wearing this hat one day. Yes. And I wear it proudly. Yes. And it has its perks. I don't wear it for the perks, but the perks do come. Right. But one of the things that's awarding to me is when a youngster will come up to me and ask me about the military. Mm -hmm. And I would tell them exactly. I tell them the good, the bad, and the ugly. Yes. And what to expect if you choose that type of life. Yes. You know. Now, really, really quick, we're going to wrap this up. We've got about five more minutes. Yes. Uh, matter, matter of fact, less than that. But I want you to touch on as far as the camaraderie and the brotherhood of the military, as far as having, uh, you know, like the reunions. Oh, yes. Uh, through the gift of social media about eight years ago, we got together, and we do this once a year, the guys that I served with when we were in our 20s, and we pick a place that we're from throughout the United States, and we come together and worship. Well, not worship. And brothership. Fellowship. fellowship. Yes. And we have a good time, and it went from being three days to four days. Yes. And we just we eat, 
we drink, we laugh, we cry, we talk about things that are uh, relative to what we are doing now. And a lot of us, when we first started this, were not service connected. Right, exactly. But now, about 90% of us are service connected. Yes. You know, word of mouth, exchanging knowledge. And what that means as far as being service connected is like now we're entitled to, to, to certain benefits and compensation from the VA, which we didn't have. Correct. And prior to that, that union of us coming back together, it was only a couple people within the group that had the knowledge as far as being service connection that right. was able to share that information with everybody else to whereas, uh, like you said, 90% of the people in the group are now benefiting from those external benefits and the compensation. Exactly. And it's not easy, though. The BA will make you work for it. Oh, it's a job. But you don't give up. You don't give up. And it's like this. If you have something and you're benefited from it, why not share this with your fellow veteran? Yes. Bring him in or her into the fold. I agree. I agree. Plain and simple. I agree. I tell you what, we're running out of time right now, Dan. Yes. Um, we, it's impossible to, to go through the history and, and, and explain all the benefits within the 30 minutes time. What I want to do is I'm going to bring you back, if that's okay. That's fine. And we're going to do another 30 minute segment, and we're going to really get into... Uh, not only just the nuts and the bolts, but also the, the, the fun side of the military. Because, again, me joining the military and joining the Navy back in 1981 was one of the best, best decisions I ever made in my life. Oh, yes. And it gave me the foundation uh, of who I am today and the people, the quality of people that I ran into that I'm still friends with to this day. And I would love for other people to have that experience to where you have lifelong friends that, that have those experience with you. That, that you can understand. Right. So, that being said, my brother, thank you for coming in. It's been a joy. It's been a pleasure. And you know what? This is season six of, of Closing the Wealth Gap. I enjoy doing this. Uh, this In this particular season, we're going to bring in a lot of experts. Some of them are going to be from the financial services field, but a lot of them are going to be just from the military and the veteran side so that we can give a full picture as far as uh, what military life is and, like he was said, the good and the bad and the ugly. So, again, this is Tyrone French. And I'm always looking forward to helping people to closing the wealth gap. That's our show for this week. Closing the wealth gap. The one show, the only show that shows you how to take control of your financial future. Right here in North County's only community radio station, OCTalkRadio.net.